Okay. Well, we are in the 20th chapter of Judges. Second to last chapter here. So why don't I open this with a word of prayer and then we'll we'll try to take this chapter and get through it this week. So, Lord, uh, I pray that you be with us, that you guide us, that you give us insight and give us application. We know that these words are not just meant for the people of the day or the people of 500 years ago or the people of 1,000 years ago, uh, but they're meant for all people because they have the application of your Holy Spirit to every word, every letter, every mark in your scripture. So we count on that. We thank you and we pray for your guidance tonight as we study these words in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Now, if you remember, among the various bizarre stories that we've covered in the book of Judges, last week we covered one of the most bizarre of all. Yeah. You know, as I said, if you were going to uh, read bed nights, uh, good night stories to your children out of the Bible, that this would not be the chapter that you'd probably choose. You know, uh, it's filled with lust, murder, deceit, adultery, revenge, uh, 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 sodomy, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we went through that last week and we tried to gain further insight into the words and explain some of the things that were in there. Now, the end of, of course, last week's chapter is really the beginning of this week's chapter. And that is that, you know, they uh, end up, uh, let's look at uh, verse 30 of, of chapter 19. And it came about that all who set, saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or, or, or has been from the day when the sons of Israel came into the land of Egypt to this very day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak up. So there is a, uh, a sense of outcry, a sense of uh, that this was a remarkably horrific event that occurred, and there's a call to action. And so that's what we're going to talk about this week, and this is what we call, this chapter is called the Benjamite War, and it's a civil war in Israel. So let's uh, start with the first seven verses and go through them. It says, And all the sons of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, came out, and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, took their stand in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Now the sons of Benjamin heard that the sons of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. And the sons of Israel said, tell us how did this wickedness take place? So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came with my concubine to spend the night at Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. But the men of Benjamin rose up against me and surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me. Instead, they ravished my concubine so that she died. And I took hold of my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout the land of Israel's inheritance for they have committed a lewd and disgraceful act in Israel. Behold, all of you sons of Israel, give your advice and counsel here. So you'll see this idiom that is from Dan to Beersheba. You might as well say in the equivalent from Maine to California. In other words, from the north to the south, uh, every part of the land, uh, they asked for a rallying. And, and all the 11 tribes 
rally to this place called Mizpah. Now, <clears throat> it's no wonder that the, the Benjamites heard about this, because I don't know if it really shows well on the map exactly, but Mizpah is about eight miles north of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem's not... Here it is. Okay, so it's about, oh, maybe between Bethel and Shiloh in that area, okay? Yeah, Gibeah is right here that we're talking about. Uh, and it's actually three miles from Gibeah. So you can see here's the inheritance of Benjamin, okay? Here's obviously Gibeah here in Benjamin. And when they rally at Mizpah, which is not exactly on this map, but it's, I think it's three miles to the east, if I remember correctly. You know, they're they're right here. I mean, it wouldn't take them a whole lot to figure out three miles away that there's 400,000 soldiers that have rallied there. <laughs> I'm certain if nothing else, you'd see the dust of 400,000 people rallying in that place. Now, um, we note that, and we'll look at this next week, we won't get into it this week, but there is actually an exception. It says that all of the tribes, even those east at Gilead, now remember what Gilead is. Gilead is that name for the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan. Okay, that's Gilead, where Moses, they asked Moses, and the, Moses asked the Lord, you know, could we settle here? It's good for our shepherding, for our cattle, our sheep, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And the Lord told him, you can settle there, you can take your inheritance there, but you must go and war with your fellows, okay, in the conquest. But at the end of the seven years, they were allowed to go back and they settled in this area. So they've been to the east uh, for quite a bit of time now. They also rally, but there is one place that doesn't rally, which we're going to hear about next week, uh, and that is uh, this area called uh, Jabesh Gilead. And there's a section there that doesn't send any representatives. And you're going to see next week this is problematic for them, <laughs> that they didn't rally with everyone else. Okay, This was a big deal to call all of Israel together. So, of course, this, this story or this chapter is the tragic consequences of the spread of sin. You're going to see it in many, many ways, and you're going to see it, how it results and the consequences. Uh, the famous theologian Spurgeon made this, uh, I think, excellent statement that I wrote down. He said, sin is the mother and nurse of all evil, the egg of all mischief, the fountain of all bitterness, and the root of all misery. I thought it was a really excellent quote, and that you're going to see tonight as we talk about this, this is indeed true. So the leaders of the tribes muster 11,000, or I'm sorry, 400,000 soldiers, the 11 tribes, 400,000 foot soldiers, and of course they decide they've got to do something, they've got to resolve this horrible situation. Now the Benjamites obviously do hear about them coming to Mizpah. But they choose, obviously, not to attend the gathering of the 11 tribes, even though they're three miles practically away from it. But they don't go. So what happens then next is the Levite narrates and kind of gives this case. It's almost in the position of a legal case. You know, he's the plaintiff here advocating for, uh, you know, a, an injustice done to him and to his concubine, et cetera, et cetera. And he's, he's now testifying before the leaders of Israel is what's going on. So, of course, he, he tells them that, uh, uh, that he, of course, was, uh, had married this concubine. Uh, he tells them the story of the men coming out of Dur Gibeah at night, they beat on the doors, uh, they, and, and as he put it here, and of course he's actually right in what he says, he, he makes a statement, and if you remember last week when I went over 
and spend some time talking about the level of interpersonal violence and homosexuality. Do you remember I went through the studies and went through the tables that I pulled on it? Remember I told you that the level of interpersonal violence in, in both uh, lesbian, gay, male, and bisexual relationships compared to heterosexual relationships that their lifetime incidence of interpersonal violence is 25 times that of heterosexual people. And of course the chart breaks down. I went through some of the studies, there were easily 25 of them that were there that I found, all of them concluding that the, that the, that the, inter, that the lifetime incidence was at, at least 25% for those types of couples and as high as possibly 50%, certainly hitting relatively close to 35 or 40%. So even though, you know, the, the media loves to portray, uh, you know, homosexual couples, lesbian couples, bisexual, transgender couples as being just happy people that want to be left alone to live their life, what we really have to see is that by endorsing this lifestyle, we are also allowing this to go on in a way that puts them at risk for tremendous interpersonal violence. You know, I also cited the this individual was this pathologist that studied homosexual murders. Do you remember I talked about that? And of course, he went through and studied them. He studied serial killers. He studied all kinds of things. And of course, he concluded that homosexual murders are some of the most violent of all murders, and that, and he he says that they are usually involve mutilation, overkill. In other words, you don't just bludgeon or stab the person. In homosexual murders, they stab them, you know, 25, 35, 50 times. Now, it, there's there's a great level of intense passion in these murders when they do occur. Well, therefore, when this Levite just says here in this verse, you know, uh, they intended to kill me, I believe that that is extremely accurate, that if he would have gone out outside the house, they not only would have raped him, but he would have undoubtedly died. Okay, this is the level of, of passion that was that was aroused here by the situation. So he's, he's undoubtedly telling the truth when he says this. Now, the one thing, of course, that he doesn't say uh, is that, number one, as a Levite, he, should, he had no business to marry a concubine because it's against the laws we went through in the book of Leviticus. He had the obligation to marry a virgin as his wife. Uh, that is the Levitical injunction. So that's kind of skipped over. Uh, it's also kind of skipped over that uh, he's more than willing to throw her outside the door to the crowd uh, where she's raped until she's dead. Uh, doesn't show maybe a great amount of sensitivity towards this concubine <laughs> or concern. That's, and that's kind of overlooked too in this. But nevertheless, you know, they're certainly not wrong to gather. They're certainly not wrong to be incensed by this, even though he, maybe he's tilting the case a little bit here. But um, now when it says in verses um, uh, in six, I believe, uh, it's for they have committed a lewd and disgraceful act. The word lewd is the word zima in the Hebrew, uh, and it means sexual perversion that is, by definition, in the Hebrew, worthy of death. That's what zimah means. Uh, so and the word disgraceful is the word nabala, and it means a strong, it's a strong term in the Hebrew for moral rebellion against divine standards and is usually used in relationship to rape or homosexual acts. So they're using very specific terms here uh, to describe these very specific actions that have occurred, and he's identifying, you know, the, in, the the level of the infractions that went on here, and therefore the need for some justice to be meted out because of it. All right. Of course, clearly 
the Levite is building a case here that, that Gibeah or these men in Gibeah deserve death. You know, for what they did, they deserved a death sentence. Clear so far? Okay, so let's, since we have 48 verses to cover tonight, let's uh, move on to verses 8 through 14. Then all the people arose as one man, saying, Not one of us shall go to his tent, nor will any of us return to his house. But now this is a thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. And he and he, we will take ten men of a hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, and a hundred out of a thousand, a thousand out of ten thousand, to supply food for the people, that when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, they may punish them for all the disgraceful acts that they have committed in Israel. Thus, all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united as one man. Then the tribes of Israel sent men through the entire tribe of Benjamin, saying, What is this wickedness that has taken place among you? So, what happens is that they decide, first of all, setting up a battle plan, that they need a supply line, a supply chain, which of course is true. I think it was Napoleon, if I remember correctly, that's made the famous statement that an army moves on the basis of its stomach. Yeah. And uh, that is true. You have to supply troops if you're going to keep them in the field. You have to set up supply lines. You have to feed them. You're talking about feeding 400,000 people. He just missed the climate. Yeah, that's true. He did. My Russian wife says, Napoleon just missed the climate. That's true. Napoleon made the tragic mistake that people have perpetually made about attacking Russia, and that is you don't do it in the winter. <laughs> it never goes well. Yeah. Didn't go well for the Nazis either, uh, you know, in the same way. But so it's interesting. It says that, as we say here, that all the people as one man sang. In other words, they make a vow. They're making a formal vow here of warfare against Gibeah of Benjamin. Uh, you want, might want to turn to uh, Deuteronomy 23. Now, yeah, Deuteronomy 23. You know, a vow was a serious thing as stated in the Torah. Look at, uh, we're going to start in verse 21 of Deuteronomy 23. Moses says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it for, it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin. In other words, you don't have to make a vow about something. But if you make a vow, you've got to keep it. And in verse 23, you shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. So he's saying, be cautious what you vow. Be prudent that you know this is what you can carry out, and if you vow it, carry it out. Mm -hmm. So I think this is an important word to all of us. You know, we may not make formal vows sometimes like they did in the Torah, but in reality, we do make vows. Like marriage? marriage is a vow. Uh, contracts, in a very real sense, are vows, aren't they? You know, they can, two parties contract to do a certain thing. Um, you know, if we promise someone something, uh, you know, I'm going to do this for you, we need to do it, you know? If, true, but it's not the same as vow to God, right? Not necessarily, but it's what comes out of your lips, remember, he says, you need to perform it. Yeah. Uh, if we say that we're going to pay someone a certain amount, mm -hmm. don't hold it back. Mm -hmm. If you're going to pay them, pay them. You know, remember the famous story in Acts 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. They took their property, they sold it, all right? They didn't have to sell it. There was no requirement they had to. Then they said to the church that they were giving it all 
for the sake of the church in Jerusalem. But they didn't give it all. It says they held back some. They were judged. They actually died. Quickly. Okay, quickly. Not because they could have, I mean, they, they had their right over the property. But once they vowed to give it all to the Lord, the Lord required it all because of their vow. And the penalty uh, came to them, which was a very severe penalty. And I think it, if you would have been in the early church, you probably would have been very impressed by what happened and thought, hmm, God's not playing around here. So there's many examples of vows, and, and I think it, it tells us that we should, we should follow through on the things that we say also. Now, back in verse 9 of Judges 20, it's an interesting phrase in, uh, in the Hebrew. It says, uh, but now this is a thing which we will do to Gib Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. It literally means let's proceed with the lot against Gibeah. And you're going to see the importance of the lot as we go on here. It's a very specific thing that they're doing. So, of course, their first lot is to select the 10% that are a supply chain, okay? Um, and uh, they're, they're going to do other lots also. Now, they, it says they were determined, they willed to be united to see justice occur because of this act. Now, I want you to notice some things as we go through this chapter. They do show resolution, okay? But they don't necessarily show wisdom, even though they have resolution. They have a right cause, but they don't necessarily prosecute it correctly. And we're going to kind of see how this might apply to us also as we go through this. So they first send out uh, delegates all around to the cities of Benjamin. There's a variety of cities here. Gibeah is only one of them. I think that's very much a correct thing to do. They're sending out de delegates. They're saying, you've heard about what happened in Gibeah. What do you think? You know, are you with us or are you against us? That's really what they're saying. And apparently they don't get a very good response from the cities around. They certainly don't get a good response from Gibeah itself. So what seems to happen is that unwisely, the Benjamites overall refused to turn over the men that did this injustice, okay? They won't turn them over. Now, you could say, you know, why? Well, you know, again, the other tribes correctly want to see sin purged from the land. Now, let's, let's look at this for a moment, sin purged from the land. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy, and I want to look at several different verses, and I want, I want us to see how important God makes this as he's telling people in the Torah what to do. Start in Deuteronomy 13, and I want to just quickly go through some of these and see that they are indeed following what God designated. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 13, 5 first. Um, let's see if I have this written down. Yeah, he, he talks about if a, that a prophet or a dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, in other words, a, a medium, because he's counseled rebellion against the Lord who brought us out of Egypt. He, if that person tries to seduce you from the way in which God the Lord your God would has command you to walk. Look at the last verse, the sentence there. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Purge the evil from among you. Okay, go to chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. And let's look at several verses there, starting in verse 6. He says, we'll start at six and then go to seven. On the evidence of two witnesses or, or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of just one witness. 
the hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people, last sentence, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. Again, go from uh, 6 and 7, I think in verse 12, it reiterates this, verse 12 there, and the man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest who stands there to serve the Lord your God, nor the judge, that man shall die, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. You see it? Again, turn to chapter 21 of Deuteronomy. And go to um, verse 21. I think it's found here. Then all the men of this city shall, shall stone him to death, so you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear of it in fear. Turn then to, uh, I think also to um, now turn lastly to chapter 24 of Deuteronomy. Verse 7. Here's another uh, infraction of the law that is considered death worthy. If a man is caught kidnapping any of his countrymen, any of the sons of Israel, and he deals with him violently and he sells him, then that thief shall die. In other words, human trafficking. That's if you want to put it today. This will give you, I think, an, a good view of how God views human trafficking, the, the, the absolute tragedy and horror of human trafficking that's going on in this country and across the world now. If you've ever looked at it, the statistics are unbelievable. We're talking about something in the hundreds of thousands to it may be in the low millions of children and women that are trafficked each year. Okay? And, of course, this happens both to make money, it's used by, you know, mafia individuals, and there's also an element of human trafficking that's used by the occult. Clearly there's evidence that the occult traffics for the rituals. And I was just looking today for a particular reason. You're going to think, oh, fun, what does he read all the time? But I was looking today at the satanic calendar. And it's, you know, you think maybe, you know, if you think, if you've ever looked at it, you might say, well, there's four basic times of the satanic calendar. There's the equinoxes and the solstices. No, 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 no. If you look at the satanic ritual calendar, there's almost every month, there's multiple days in which there's some form of satanic ritual that's being done. Okay. Right before Halloween in the week before are called the days of preparation. And this is where they gather individuals that are slaughtered on Halloween. There's a seven-day period of what they call the gathering. It happens in cults every year. Okay? So, you know, trafficking is a horrific thing on multiple levels. And, of course, this is an example. He, so what does he say here at the very end of the sentence? of one that traffics, the one that, that uh, kidnaps, so you shall purge evil from among you. Again, so God's very serious about, so they, they, they are right about the fact that they want to purge the situation. And of course, uh, you know, if you think about it also, they are very much told in this sense to not be tolerant, right? They have an issue here. It's a horrific issue. They, they're trying to address this issue, and they're not being tolerant. Think about our culture. Think of all the morally reprehensible things that are going on in our culture. But what does the media, what does the liberal element of the political spectrum say about all these things? What's their mantra over and over again? We're supposed to be tolerant. We're supposed to be accepting. Yes, we're supposed to be embracing. But God is not tolerant of sin. He's never been tolerant of sin. He never will be tolerant of sin. 
And so if people will say to you, well, you take a Christian position and you're intolerant, you can rightfully say, yes, God's intolerant of sin. Of course, he has a solution for sin right away for every person, right, to pay for their sin and to bring them into a loving relationship with him. But sin itself, he is intolerant of. Okay? Again, what's the point of this chapter? Because they tolerated sin, there's going to be this enormous price that's going to be paid in lives because they did it. Sin leads to consequences. And we're going to see how bloody these consequences are in this particular case. Now, the Benjamites either because of tribal loyalty or because of having a similar low moral view themselves or because of simply rebellion or maybe because they simply don't want anyone telling them to do anything. You know, they just are not going to accept. Well, maybe because they had many relatives in that group. Maybe because they had relatives in that group. You know, who knows all the reasons, but they refused to turn these men over. The simple solution that would have saved enormous number of lives would be if they would simply have identified these men in that city that did this, turn them over, and they would have been per prosecuted and, of course, uh, executed for what they did. Deed done, penalty paid, everyone could go home. But because they refused to do this, they set the country on fire. I guess that, and you're going to see how much they did in this sense. In the most literal sense, they set it on fire. So because of their refusal, it's now inevitable that there was going to be a lot of people that would be killed to stamp this sin out. If you want to, looking from the standpoint of the New Testament, turn to 1 Corinthians 5 and see an admonition that really fits here, I think. 1 Corinthians 5. We're going to look at verses 6, 7, and 8. He's talking about, in verse, if you'll need, well, let's read verse 5 too. He's talking about this person in Corinth who's committed a pretty horrendous sin. Apparently, it appears, I believe, that he's had a sexual relationship with either his mother or his mother-in-law or his stepmother. I, I think it's, Michael, is it? Step, stepmother's. Is that the best Greek the best interpretation? Best. Okay. All right. Yeah. So apparently it's stepmother that he had. So Paul learns of this and says to them, you've done nothing to address this. It's horrific that you've allowed this in the church. So he says, verse 5, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the days of the Lord Jesus. So he's telling them he's going to be singled out for the appropriate punishment that needs to be, which, of course, in this case is excommunication. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? The leaven is always a picture for the exponential increase of sin if it's allowed. Okay? Where's one of the first mentions we have about leaven? Passover. The Passover. Right? It's coming up quite soon, in a few weeks. You know, they had to take any leaven and get it out of their houses for Passover. And therefore, the only bread they could make would be matzah, okay? And that's the bread, the unleavened bread that they had to eat. So he's referring back to this Old Testament principle of the leaven. And then he says in verse 7, clean out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, or a new, literally, a new matzah, just as you are, in fact, unleavened, for Christ our Passover over also has been sacrificed. So here's the admonition of the church, just like in the Torah. Don't allow sin to have its place. Don't, because it will have an infectious effect on the group if you do. 
Now, the Benjamites we see here, instead of turning over these men, prepare themselves for war. Okay, they apparently had pride, going back to Judges here, uh, if you want to see, I think it's in verse 14. Uh, verse, yeah, it says, The sons of Benjamin gathered from the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the sons of Israel. Now you're going to read something about the Benjamites. It's interesting. They apparently had a unique military ability. And we're going to see it in the next few verses. And they had a great pride about it. This military ability is very interesting because it's predicted in the book of Genesis. I want you to go there. I want to show this to you. Isn't it interesting how the Bible fits together perfectly? Every part of it has a predictive value for other elements of it. So go to Genesis 49 and look at verse 27. This is a prediction by Jacob, okay, about his sons and the future descendants of each tribes. In Genesis 49:27, he says, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey. In the evening he divides the spoil. In other words, Benjamin is going to be a, mil a potent military force, okay? A predator, one that is able to jump on their prey and devour it. That's the prediction that's made here in Genesis, in Genesis 49. So they expected, the Benjamites, that their skill militarily would cause them to prevail, even though they're not paying attention to the fact that they're outnumbered approximately 20 to 1, which are really not very good odds in a military situation to be outnumbered that way. But they, they believed, really, in their arrogance that they were going to be able to overcome this. Okay? Good so far? All right, let's read verses 15 through 26 in Judges. And from, the, and from the cities on that day, the numbers of Benjamin were numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who were numbered 700 choice men. So totally, apparently, there's 26,700 that start out. Of all these people, 700 choice men were left-handed. Each one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss it. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Then the men of Israel, besides Benjamin, were numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of war. Now the sons of Israel arose and went to Bethel, and inquired of God, and said, Who shall go up first for us to battle against the sons of Benjamin? Then the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. So the sons of Israel arose in the morning and camped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel arrayed for battle against them at Gibeah. So you can imagine the scene. You know, here's this number that we're going to talk about of, of men of Judah that line up against Gibeah in, in the morning in this battle. Then the sons of Benjamin come out against Gibeah and fell to the ground on that day 22,000 men of Israel. So there's, the first day of battle, there's 22,000 men of Judah that die at the hand of the Benjamites. Okay? But the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and arrayed for battle again in the place where they had arrayed for battle themselves the first day. Verse 23, And the sons of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall we again draw near for battle against the sons of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said to them, Go up against them. Then the sons of Israel came against the sons of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah the second day 
and fell to the ground again 18,000 men of the sons of Israel, all these who drew a sword. Then all the sons of Israel and all the people went up and came to Bethel and wept. Thus they remained there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they and they burnt and and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, let me try to go through this and explain this to you. First of all, it's interesting that the Benjamites talked about 700, quote, left-handed men who use slings. The word there is Yad Yememo. Yad Yememo, left-handed. It literally means, interestingly, obstructed in the right hand. <laughs> That's what the phrase means, obstructed in the right hand. Remember, and we won't turn here, but in Judges 3.15, you remember the Judge Ehud? Mm-hmm. Remember, he was a left-handed man, and he made this 20-inch dagger and strapped it on his right thigh. You remember? Because they didn't, and, because they didn't expect it. And he goes into... King Eglon, and of course he assassinates him, you know, is piercing him through his abdomen. They didn't expect him because they didn't know he was left-handed. So they checked him for where his sword should have been, but there wasn't one. But they didn't realize that it was on the other side. So we remember this. Now, let's talk about the sling of these 700. Of course, it's a very ancient tool of war. I found this reference that the inhabitants of the ancient islands of Majorca and Menorca, okay, which is in the Mediterranean, could hit a piece of bread on a pole at 200 yards with a sling. So these 700 from Gibeah that were trained, they were essentially were sharpshooters who obviously rarely missed. As a matter of fact, when we look at this, we realize that at a, using a pebble and a sling, you can sling a stone easily over 100 miles an hour. Obviously, you can't see it coming, okay? So it's like, it's like a sharpshooter from a distance, you know? You can't see the bullet approaching you, obviously, and so it's lethal. So they really picked off these men from Judah and at a tremendous slaughter these first two days they go to war. So, even though, of course, they were going against the largest gathering of a Jewish army ever in the Old Testament, we have no knowledge of any greater group that was ever gathered than 400,000 in Israel. So it's a big contingent that they're going against. Now, the leaders, of course, after the first and second pro- battles, where they're slaughtered, 40,000, if you add them together, die. They go to Bethel, to the tabernacle, okay, and they decide first time to have a lot. The lot, is, of course, is, is who's going to go out first. And the Lord says, in the lot, they obviously go to the high priest. It would appear that they use, as in the Old Testament earlier, the ermine and the thuman. They throw the lot. It comes out that Judah is supposed to go first. Now, of course, we're not certain exactly why. I'm suspicious that the reason why Judah was picked by lot is because where did the concubine grow, concubine grow up? In Judah. So my suspicion is that may be why the Lord did that. So they go out, and of course, they think that they're going to have a a great conquest this first day, and they get slaughtered. So 22,000 die. They go into a second day of battle, again, trying to encourage themselves. And of course, they lose 18,000 on that day. So they've just lost 10% of their force in two days of battle. It hasn't looked very good. So I think now there's a certain amount of doubt that's going on in the contingent about the wisdom or trying to understand why, because the Lord's told them to go do this. It's not that their cause is wrong, but I think you're going to see that their approach is wrong. 
So they finally end up, as we see here, a, approaching after the second loss. They go to the priest. They go to where the Ark of the Covenant is, and notice what it says. They fast, and they, and they uh, give uh, sacrifice and peace offerings. So they're going to the Levitical priest, and they're offering. Now, why are they doing that? What's different this time? Why are they offering peace offerings and sacrifices? For who? For what purpose? They want to win. Okay, but what's the, but what are they now? The third time, what are they trying to? What do they realize they need to take care of number one? Their own sin. Okay, they finally go, and instead of just wanting to know who goes first, they finally go after two consecutive losses, and they humble themselves in repentance with these offerings to expiate their own sin first. So now, after two losses, they approach it the right way. And of course, they begin therefore to get the right result. So again, I think you have to learn from this. The order of events is important. You can have the right motive, okay? You can have the right cause, and you can approach it carnally through the flesh and not be successful. And I think we always have to remember this. It's not just motive, it's not just just cause, but there needs to be a humbling where we say to the Lord, okay, if this is the right cause and you want me to do this, I recognize my own frailty. How should I approach this? Show me how. And that's the way we need to approach these things. It's very, you know, again, they're really revved up here. They're, they're all fired up because of the sin. We're ready to go do the battle. So again, in their zeal, they miss some really important points, and 40,000 people die because of it. So good lesson, I think, for us to learn. So after this failure, now they finally approach it the correct way. So let's look at the correct way. So let's go to uh, Judges, and let's read... 27 through 48. I'm, 20, I'm sorry, 27 through 35. So the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord for the Ark of the Covenant of God uh, uh, in those days where it was. And we, we have an interesting note here. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, Aaron's son, stood there before it to minister in those days saying, I shall yet go out to the battle. Then they say, shall I yet go out to the battle against the sons of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? So they finally go to Phineas. They've done the sacrifice they're supposed to, and they ask, do we continue or do we cease? Now here's the response they get. And the Lord said, go up for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Now, approaching it the right way, the Lord says, I will deliver them tomorrow into your hand. Now, this, this, the fact that Phineas is still the high priest here, Eliezer's son, shows us that this is probably, remember I told you that these chapters, these last five chapters in Judges, we don't, they don't have a specific time frame. They could have occurred at different times. This obviously was early on in the period of the judges. Because, the correct. So it had to be in the early period that this event occurs. So we, we have a, this is one of the few elements in these last five chapters that we have a historical reference to, probably. Now, um, so... <clears throat> They, they uh, let me go on here. So what happens is that, let's see, do we finish all the way through 35? No. Okay, let's, let's keep reading. Let's start in um, 29. So Israel set men in ambush around Gibeah. 
And the sons of Israel went up against the sons of Benjamin on the third day and arrayed themselves against Gibeah, as at other times. The sons of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city, and they began to strike and kill some of the people, as at, uh, as at other times, on the highways, and one which goes up to Bethel, and the other to Gibeah, and also in the field. They killed about 30 men of Israel. Verse 32, And the sons of Benjamin said, They are struck down before us, as at the first. But the sons of Israel said, Let us flee, that we may draw them away from the city into the highways. Then all the men of Israel arose from their place and arrayed themselves at Baal Tamar, and the men of Israel in ambush broke out of their place, even out of, of Mar- Maria Geba. Uh, then 10,000 choice men from all Israel came against Gibeah, and the battle became fierce, but Benjamin did not know that the disaster was close to them. And the Lord struck Benjamin before Israel, so that the sons of Israel destroyed 25,100 men of Benjamin that day, all who drew the sword. So the third day, we have a very different outcome. It appears that when God says, go out the third day, I will give uh, Benjamin into your hands, he is given the battle plan. And the battle plan includes this ambush. So part of the tribe's forces array as usual, and they begin to engage the Benjamites, but they feign a retreat. They start to move backwards, which, of course, encourages the Benjamites, because they've won two days in a row, to follow them. So they go out further and further and further away from the city of Gibeah. But there's a hidden force that's been put down there, 10,000, it says, valiant men. They wait until they see a signal, which is going to occur, and then they attack. So uh, as a result of these two elements, we're going to see a total of 25,100 of Benjamites are killed in total. That means there's only 600 at the end of this that's left of them, of the whole tribe of Benjamin. Okay? And we're going to look also at other things that happen here. So the, this is why it says in verse 35, notice, so the Lord struck Benjamin. Okay? He gives them the battle plan. He gives them the strategy. And, of course, they're successful because of it. Now, it's going to break it down a little bit in the last verses here. So let's read 36 through 48. So the sons of Benjamin uh, saw that day that they were defeated when the men of Israel gave ground to Benjamin because they rallied on the men in the ambush who they had set against Gibeah. And the men in ambush hurried and rushed against Gibeah, And and the men in ambush also deployed and struck all the city with the edge of the sword. So, again, the implication is some of the uh, people of Gibeah and the Benjamites were still protecting the city, but a very, very large contingent went out and went after the, the main battle force. It says, 38, Now the appointed sign between the men of Israel... And the men in ambush was that they should make a great cloud of smoke rise from the city. In other words, as they attacked the city, they set it on fire. Okay? Verse 39, then the men of Israel turned in the battle, that is the men outside that have been feigning the retreat. Okay? And Benjamin began to, and they, and it says, in, uh, they turned in the battle, that is they stopped and turned around. And Benjamin began to strike and kill about 30 men of Israel, for they said, surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. Verse 40, but when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, Benjamin looked behind them, and behold, the whole city was going up in smoke to heaven. So they turn around and see the city, and it's ablaze. Now they realize they have no place to retreat to at all. Verse 41, 
Then the men of Israel turned, and the men of Benjamin were terrified, for they saw that disaster was close to them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel toward the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, while those who came out of the cities destroyed them in the midst of them. They surrounded Benjamin, pursued them without rest, and trod them down opposite Gibeah toward the east. Thus 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were valiant warriors. Verse 45, the rest turned and fled towards the wilderness to the rock of Rimon. But they, were caught, but they caught 5,000 of them on the highways and overtook them uh, at, at Giddon and killed 2,000 of them. So all of Benjamin who fell that day were 25,000 who, who had drawn the sword. All these were valiant warriors. But 600 men turned and fled towards the wilderness to the rock of Rimon. And they, main, and, they main, and they remained at the rock of Rimon four months. Verse 48, the men of Israel then turned back against the sons of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, both the entire city with the cattle and all that they found. They also set on fire all the cities which were there that they found. Okay, so it's a two-pronged attack that continues. Of course, once the city begins to burn, there's this cloud of smoke, as we said, and the tribe's forces turn and surround uh, and pinch the troops of the Benjamites outside the city. As we said here, the Benjamites realize that they'd been outwitted and, of course, are going to be defeated. Uh, and they lose any confidence, and of course they begin to flee in different directions. Some of them in the wilderness, some towards Riman. Okay. Now we see here kind of a, an accounting of the numbers. There's different segments of the Benjamites. Uh, this is a troop conquest breakdown. Eighteen thousand die outside the city. Five thousand are left that flee. They're chased down. Two thousand of those are initially die. And what you find is of the 3,000, they also end up being chased down and die. And, of course, in verse 40, it says the whole city, uh, uh, when they say the whole city, th this word here is often used of burning, uh, of, of a burnt offering. It's, it's used, the exact same phrase is used in, Deut in Deuteronomy 33.10. So really, from God's standpoint, the city becomes a sacrifice of sin. And it's burnt. And you'll notice they burn the cattle, just like they did in Joshua's conquest. Everything was under the ban. Everything was destroyed. That's the impression that's given here. So the whole town is a burnt offering because of the sin. So they expiate the sin which has occurred there. Now in verse 42, it appears that people of the surrounding cities also, some of them that aren't part of Benjamin, join in this battle of the fleeing Benjamites and kill them also. Now, the 5,000 are cut down to 3,000, and eventually the 3,000 are cut down. As it says here, they, they, flock to the, they flee originally to the flock of Rimon. This is a conical-shaped limestone hill. It's about four miles east of Bethel. In it are a whole series of caves that are all through it. So they have a place that they can hide out that would be more difficult for the, 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 the rest of the troops to, you know, go into the caves and kill all of them. But what the rest of Israel does is they halt and they stop any battle activities for four months, it says. So we see an accounting here that when you add it all together, we see here that there are only 600 Benjamites left that are left here at Rimon. Uh, these are the survivors at the Rock of Rimon. And of course, this is all that remains of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, even though they have been very successful in eventually, you know, uh, dealing with a sin, there's another problem that they have, which is why I believe God halted them for four months when there's 600 left. 
And the problem they have is, that as you look at further in the Old Testament, as you look at the promises in the Old Testament, as you look at the stories about the tribes of Israel, they all include the tribe of Benjamin. Matter of fact, you don't have to turn if you want to, but last week we looked at Revelation 7, okay, about the 144,000, 12,000 of each tribe. And in verse 8, it says 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin. Matter of fact, <laughs> it's rather prophetic that something has to be stopped here because if you turn to, you don't have to, but if you turn to Romans 11, 1, you see a very interesting thing. The apostle talks about himself. A Hebrew is of the tribe of Benjamin. So if they had been wiped out, we'd never have the apostle Paul, which would really be problematic for the New Testament, wouldn't it? So God in his divine wisdom stops them so that there are now 700 left. Okay? Now, we're going to see next week what happens with the, the I'm sorry, six, 600 left. We're going to see what happens with the 600 next week. It's a very interesting story in the last chapter of Judges that we'll take. Now, let's talk about what we should learn or what lessons we should learn from this chapter. First of all, having a just cause and having a desire to confront evil by itself does not guarantee victory. That's the first thing we should learn. And we should look at that in our own lives. Even in our own efforts to confront sin, we can't get rid of all of it in terms of behaviorally or attitudinally, can we? Even though the sin is paid for spiritually, it's impossible as much as we try to attack the flesh even though we try to, and, and we try to, you know, uh, the old man dying so that the new man can live more and more, only at the end of our life, when this body dies, are we going to be totally free from it. So it's, a, it even, you know, it's an important lesson to learn. Okay? Confrontation of evil can be often mixed with personal revenge or a personal vendetta. And if it is, it won't succeed. Many people have this problem. They'll identify something that's sinful, but really what their really their agenda is that they've been offended and it's a personal revenge or a personal vendetta they try to engage people in, and that's wrong. That's not the right motive. Just because you were offended doesn't mean you're, you're to seek revenge. Um, obviously, what's the famous, you know, do not seek your own revenge, beloved, but, but what, what does it say? Vengeance, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay, which he exactly does in this chapter. God repays, but we're not to repay in that sense, vengeance. Now, thirdly, the Benjamites defended evil actions. They did not inquire about Gibeah, they did not vet their situation accurately, they defended evildoers, and I think mainly because they were Benjamites, they were of us. And of course, we see this attitude also in the world around. We see groups that because they're their particular entity, they won't really correctly vet their individuals. Cults never do this, right? Cult groups get together. Do they ever vet what's going on accurately? Do they ever really vet the leader well? Do they ever vet the motive? Do they ever look at the finances? Do they? No, they, they don't. They overlook all this because they're taken by this cult leader, and they let evil prevail because of it. Groups will do this. Cult groups will do this. Uh, and, of course, uh, what we see here is that uh, even – let me give you another example of this. And you've seen it yourself as a school teacher, and it's even more true today. How often do teachers today in the schools, if they have a problem with a student and their behavior, they bring in the parents, and what is the most likely outcome the teacher will get when they meet with the parent? They defend their child. Exactly. 
They defend their own child. They won't listen to the, to the observation of others. They won't listen to the observation of the teacher. They won't listen to the documentation that's been done about the child's behavior. All they do is they get angry at the teacher. How dare you talk to my child this way? How dare you bring this up? How dare you say this about my dear darling? And what are they allowing because of it? Right. The behavior is never dealt with. The attitude of the child is never dealt with. They now encourage more of this type of behavior. And of course, no one benefits. The school group doesn't benefit. The teacher doesn't benefit. The child doesn't benefit. It just creates more problems in the situation. How many times does this go on every day of every week of every school year? Okay? It's constant. So we see this attitude all the time, that people won't correctly address these things when they should be addressing these things. Now, a fourth thing that we should learn by all this is only by seeking and praying and repenting and listening can God show us the right tactic to confront whatever evil that we're trying to deal with. Now, don't just launch your own attack presumptuously. You know, it needs serious consultation. And I was thinking about the prayer of Daniel in Daniel 9. You know, you know he, he looks at the condition of Israel. He looks at their captivity. He seeks the Lord. And what does he start out with in this beautiful prayer? Oh, Lord, we have sinned. Exactly. He goes through 25 verses enumerating all the sins of Israel and saying, Lord, we've done this. We've defiled. We've allowed idolatry. We've done this. We've done that. And then at the end, he says, O oh Lord, hear us. O oh Lord, listen. And then finally, he says, O oh Lord, act, right, in that chapter. So it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful prayer that we really should model in our own lives. The, it's Daniel 9. Now, most of the chapter there. Uh, so this is, the, this is the proper approach that we should take. And now, it's in response to that prayer that God reveals the most incredible prophetic paragraph in the entire Bible. Absolutely. Verses 20 through 20, 27 follow this prayer, which is the greatest prayer about what happens in the last seven years, it outlines the last seven years of the tribulation period and the elements of it. That's what occurs after the repentance of the prayer. The angel brings this information to Daniel. That's a very good point. Okay, finally, <clears throat> a culture or a country or a large group may decide that some event or some political decision is totally objectionable and that there's no further compromise that can be made with the other parties. This can lead, of course, to some form eventually of a civil war. Okay? Now, this is something that's been discussed in the media in this country quite a bit in the last few years. Would you agree? You, you, I'm certain you've read articles. We see a, a, a division between the political left and the political right. We see the polarization that you know, President Trump has, uh, quote, created in this country. We see seemingly insurmountable differences between the political left and the political right, between the more conservative and the more liberal groups. We see the division between those that live in the big cities and those that live in the smaller towns and the rural areas. I mean, this country seems as divided as you can imagine it. Certainly, I can't ever remember in 68 years it being more divided than it is right now. Can any of you? Yes. I think that really started with Obama. He's the one who started the division. He did. Yeah, he did. He did. He did. He really encouraged a racial divide very much in this country. Instead of unifying, 
He talked about class warfare or encouraged class warfare. You know, he encouraged divisions between the rich and the poor, encouraged divisions between black and white, encouraged divisions between other racial groups. He encouraged this whole whiteness movement that, you know, that white people are guilty because they're white, you know, which, of course, is absolutely no different than you know, than uh, attacking black people because they're black. What would the difference be? And there's no merit to attacking people based on their race. We certainly had a civil war that had to occur to try to correct that one. And then years later, a civil rights movement. So it doesn't play well. We know historically it leads to bad things. But I want to tell you, there are people that also, if you read on the Internet, that are, quote, unquote, ready for civil war. I don't know if you've read them. I've read all kinds of blogs of people that say, bring it on, you know, and I want to say these things to any people that have that attitude. I don't know if there's going to be a civil war or not civil war in this country. I have no idea. But I do want to say these things about those that would cavalierly talk about civil war. Civil wars are notoriously ruthless. Okay? As a matter of fact, I tried to look up some statistics. It's difficult to find exact statistics, but the best I can come up with is since 1900, we've had somewhere around 10 million people die as a result of civil war. There's, it's probably greater than that when you talk about the casualties also caused by infections, not having proper water that also called, caused because, because of civil war. But it seems to be that the direct combatants and, and people, uh, ethnicities in these wars have killed about 10 million people. That's the size of New York City. That's a lot of people. They're ruthless. They're bloody. They're continuously involved in, with vengeance. They involve uh, 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 directed assassinations of people in political positions over and over again. You know, they involve military units which, of course, uh, that go against other military units, they incite a whole furor that once a civil war begins, becomes extremely difficult to end. It's almost like it incites a level of violence, an intensity of violence. It's almost like a fire that then becomes very difficult to burn out. Many civil wars in Africa and the list of nations that have had civil wars in Africa are very long. That's why I found it difficult to give exact numbers because there are so many civil wars that have occurred in, just in Africa by itself, not, in, not including the former Yugoslavia, not including, I mean, there's just a lot of them around the world. But they're, they're vicious, and people die because of these things. People are dislocated because of these things. People end up having absolutely no sense of security of life whatsoever. They don't know where to get food. They don't know where to live. And they end up living in hovels, try, trying to eat whatever pieces of whatever they can. This is what happens in a civil war. It's not a lovely thing. And people can glory about, you know, incitement of it. But if it gets incited, it's an absolutely horrible thing. And, of course, this is what we, we see here, this action by the 11 tribes, because the one tribe would not conciliate and deal with the sin that was there. It cost Israel, if you add the numbers together, 65,000 dead soldiers. That doesn't count military deaths in other cities it doesn't count civilian deaths in the cities around. It doesn't, because you remember, there are burnt cities that occur, and there are other cities that they went after that were in Benjamin. So, you know, and it almost exterminated one whole tribe of Israel. So, this was a very serious undertaking, a very sad undertaking. And again, we need to learn many lessons about these things in our own lives, in our own culture, uh, about these very issues. So.
Wouldn't it have been interesting if they approached the Lord with repentance before they went into that? Yes. Well, it it's, had a different outcome. at least they wouldn't have lost 40,000 that way. Right. You know, that the, 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 they, they still would have obviously lost the 25,100 of, of Benjamin mm -hmm. because that's, they put themselves in that position. Don't, don't they usually marry within their tribe? Like, do you, so if Benjamin, if it was purged, the city and the women and children... You just brought up next week's topic. Okay. Next week's topic to finish off the judges is, what do we do about Benjamin? Okay, because they find themselves in a bind. And you're going to see what their bind is. And they come up with a clever solution. <laughs> it's a little disingenuous, but it's clever. <laughs> but it, it at least does the job because they repopulate the tribe of Benjamin as a result. So... Okay, now, uh, why don't we go ahead and, and, and let me just uh, say the prayer to end tonight, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all that are here. Uh, we pray that you would take these words and apply them to our lives and, get, and in our conscience and our mind. Let us be aware of these things, these tendencies let us be aware of evil. Let us be aware of the need to confront it. But let us also be aware of the wisdom of how to confront it. Because we, we always face these things in our lives. We always face people, situations, and events where evil occurs. So give us wisdom. Give us guidance. And we thank you for these things in Christ's name. And we pray, amen.